Hi guys, I'm going to read to you our section eight for this week of the one and only Ivan, where we had left off before. Um, Ivan was kind of telling Ruby a story and um, going back to what had happened with his family when he was taken. And um, we left off with a visit. So the last thing that Mac came in and said to Ivan was, Ivan, my man. We've been through a lot, you and me. So now we're continuing with our section eight. A new beginning is the first title. We don't see Mac for two days. When he returns, he doesn't talk about Stella. Mac says he's anxious to teach Ruby some tricks. He says the billboard is bringing in more visitors. He says it's time for a new beginning. All afternoon and into evening, Mac works with Ruby. Ruby's feet are looped with ropes so she cannot run. A heavy chain hangs off her neck. Mac shows her Stella's ball, her pedestal, her stool. He introduces her to Snickers. When Ruby obeys Mac, he gives her a cube of sugar or a bit of dried apple. When she doesn't, he yells and kicks at the sawdust. When George and Julia arrive, Mac is still training Ruby. Julia sits on a bench and watches them. She draws a little, but mostly keeps her eyes on Ruby. Bob watches too. He's hiding in the corner of my domain under not tag. It's raining outside and Bob does not like damp feet. Ruby trudges behind Mac, her head drooping. Endlessly, they circle the ring. Sometimes Mac slaps her flank with his hand. Suddenly, Ruby jerks to a stop. Mac pulls, up the, cha pulls the chain hard, but Ruby refuses to move. Come on, Ruby. Mac is almost pleading. What is your problem? She's exhausted, I say to myself. That's the problem. Mac groans. Idiot elephant. Idiot human, Bob mutters. <laughs> Walk, Ruby, I say, although I know she's too far away to hear me. What does, do what he says. Walk, Mac commands, now. Ruby doesn't walk. She plops her rump on the sawdust floor. I think maybe she's tired, Julia says. Mac wipes his forehead with the back of his arm. Yeah, I know, we're all tired. He pushes Ruby to the heel of his, with the heel of his boot. She ignores him. George looks over from the food court where he is wiping off tables. Mac, he yells, maybe you should call it a day. I'll close up. Mac yanks on Ruby's chain as she's as anchored as a tree trunk. He pulls harder and falls to his knees. That does it, Mac says. He brushes sawdust off of his jeans. I am through playing around. Mac stomps off to his office. When he returns, he's carrying a long stick. The gleaming hook on its end is almost beautiful, like the sliver of a moon. It's a claw stick. Mac pokes Ruby with the sharp point. Not hard, just a touch. I can tell he wants her to see how much it can hurt. I growl low in my throat. Ruby doesn't budge. She is a gray, unmoving boulder. She closes her eyes, and for a moment, I wonder if she might have fallen asleep. I'm warning you, Max says. He breathes out. He stares at the ceiling. Ruby makes a huffing sound. Fine, Max says. You want to play that way? No. He draws back the claw stick. No, Julia cries. I'm not going to hurt her, Max says. I just want to get her attention. Bob snarls. Max swings. The hook slices the air just a few inches above Ruby's head. See why you don't want to mess with me, Max says. He draws back the claw stick again. Now move. Ruby jerks her head, flinging her trunk toward Max. She makes a noise that sends the sawdust scattering. It makes my glass shiver. It is the most beautiful mad I have ever heard. Ruby's trunk slaps into Mac. I don't see exactly where she strikes him, somewhere below his stomach, I think. And I know he must be uncomfortable because Mac drops the claw stick and falls on the ground and curls into a ball and howls like a baby. Direct hit, Bob says. Poor Mac. Mac groans. He stumbles to his feet and hobbles off toward his office. Ruby watches him leave. I can't read her expression. Is she afraid? Relieved? Proud? 
When Mac is gone, George and Julia lead Ruby from the ring. It's okay, baby. It's okay, Julia says, stroking Ruby's head. They settle Ruby in her doma domain and make sure she has fresh food and water. Before long, Ruby's dozing. Dad, Julia asks as George locks Ruby's iron door, do you think Mac would ever hurt Ruby? I don't think so, Jules, George says. At least I hope not. Maybe we could call someone. George scratches his chin. I wish I could help Ruby, but I wouldn't know how. I mean, who would I call? The elephant cops? Besides, George looks down. I need this job, Jules. We need this job. Your mom, the doctor bills. He kisses the top of Julia's head. Back to work, you and me both. Julia sighs and reaches for her backpack. She removes a piece of paper, a bottle of water, and a small metal box. Homework first, George says, wagging his finger. Then you can paint. It's for art class, Julia explains. We're doing watercolors. I'm going to paint Ruby. George smiles. All right, then. Just don't forget your spelling. Dad, Julia asks again, did you see Mac's face when Ruby hit him? George nods. Yes, he says solemnly, I did. He shakes his head. Poor Mac. He turns away and then and that and only then do I hear him laughing. Colors. Julia opens the metal box. I see a row of little squares, green, blue, red, black, yellow, purple, orange. The colors seem to glow. She pulls out a brush with a thin tuft of a tail as it end, at its end. She dips the brush in water and wets the paper and then taps at the red square. When the brush meets the damp paper, pink petals of color unfurl like morning flowers. Excuse me. I can't take my eyes off that magical brush. For a moment, I'm not thinking about Ruby and Mac and the claw stick and Stella, almost. Julia touches red again, then blue, and then there suddenly is the purple of a ripe grape. She touches the blue and her paper turns to summer sky, black and white, and now I see that she's painting a picture of Ruby. I can make out her floppy ears and her thick legs. Julia stops painting. She takes a few steps back, hands on her hips, gazing at her work. She scowls. It's not right, she says. She glances over her shoulder at me. I try to look encouraging. Julia starts to crumple up the paper, then reconsiders. Instead, she slides it into my cage at the spot where my glass is broken. Here you go, she says. A Julia original. That'll be worth millions someday. Gingerly, I pick up the paper. I do not eat a single bite of it. Oh, hey, I almost forgot. Julia runs to her backpack. She pulls out three plastic jars, one yellow, one blue, one red. She opens the jars and an odd, not food smell hits my nose. Julia pushes the jars one by one through the opening. Then she slides some paper through. These are called finger paints, she says. My aunt gave them to me, but really I'm too old for finger painting. I stick a finger into the jar. The paint is as thick as mud. It's cool and smooth like bananas underfoot. I pop my finger into my mouth. It's not exactly ripe mango, but it's not bad. Julia laughs, you don't eat it, you paint with it. She grabs a piece of paper and presses her finger on it. See, like this. I place my finger on a piece of paper. I lift it and a red mark is there. I get a bigger blob from the pot and slap my hand down. On the page, when I pulled my hand off the paper, it's red twin stays behind. This isn't like the ghostly handprints on my glass, the ones my visitors leave behind. This handprint can't be so easily wiped away. A bad dream. I lie awake, peeling dried red paint off my fingertips. Bob, who accidentally walked on one of my paintings, is licking his red paws. Every so often, I glance over at the empty ring. The claw stick glints in the moonlight. Stop, no, Ruby's frantic cries startle me. Ruby, I call, you're having a bad dream. You're okay, you're safe. Where's Stella, she asks, gulping air. Before I can answer, she says, never mind, I remember now. 
Go back to sleep, Ruby, I say. You've had a hard day. I can't go back to sleep, she says. I'm afraid I'll have the same dream. There was a sharp stick and it hurt. I look at Bob and he looks back at me. Oh, Ruby. Oh, Ruby says. Oh, Mac. She puts her trunk between the bars. Do you think, she hesitates. Do you think Mac is mad because I heard him today? I consider lying, but gorillas are terrible liars. Probably, I say finally. He ran, af who, he ran away after that, Ruby says. Bob gives, gives a scornful laugh. Crawled away is more like it. We are quiet for a while. Branches claw at the roof. A light rain drums. One of the parrots murmurs something in her sleep. Ruby breaks the silence. Ivan, I smell something funny. He can't help it, Bob says. I believe she's referring to the finger paints Julia gave me, I say. What are finger paints, Ruby asks. You make pictures with them, I explain. Could you make a picture of me? Maybe someday. I remember Julia's picture, the one that will be worth million, a million dollars. I hold it up to the glass. Look, it's you. Julia made it. It's hard to see, Ruby says. There's not much moonlight. Why do I have two trunks? I examine the picture. Those are feet. Why do I have two feet? That's called artistic license, Bob says. Ruby sighs. Could you tell me another story, she asks. I don't think I can ever go back to sleep. I told you all I remember, I say with a helpless shrug. Then tell me a new story, she says. Make something up. I try to think, but my thoughts keep returning to Mac and his claw stick. Anything yet? Ruby asks. I'm working on it. Ivan, Ruby presses. Bob said you're going to save me. I, I search for true words. I, I'm working on that too. Ivan, Ruby says in a voice so low I can barely hear her. I have another question. I can tell from the sound of her voice that this will be a question I don't want to answer. Ruby taps her trunk against the rusty iron bars of her door. Do you think, she asks, that I'll die in this domain someday, like Aunt Stella? Once again, I consider lying, but when I look at Ruby, the half-formed words die in my throat. Not if I can help it, I say instead. I feel something tighten in my chest, something dark and hot, and it's not a domain, I add. I pause and then I say, it's a cage. The story. I look at the ring layered with fresh sawdust. I look at the skylight and the half hidden moon. I just thought of a story, I say. It is a made up, is it a made up story or a true one? Ruby asks. True, I say, I hope. Ruby leans against the bars. Her eyes hold the pale moon in them, the way a still pond holds stars. Once upon a time, I say, there was a baby elephant. She was smart and brave, and she needed to go to a place called a zoo. What's a zoo, Ruby asks. A zoo, Ruby, is a place where humans make amends. A good zoo is a place where humans care for animals and keep them safe. Did the baby elephant get to the zoo, Ruby asks softly. I don't answer right away. Yes, I say at last. How did she get there, Ruby asks. She had a friend, I say, a friend who made a promise. How? It takes a long time, but finally Ruby returns to sleep. Ivan, Bob whispers, yawning. What you said about the zoo, how are you going to do that? Suddenly I feel it as if I could sleep for a thousand days. I don't know, I admit. You'll think of something, Bob says confidently, his voice trailing off as his eyes close. What if I don't, I ask, but Bob is already asleep. His little red feet dance, and I know he's running in his dreams. Remembering. Bob and Ruby sleep on. I don't sleep. I think about the promise I made Stella and the pictures I've made for Ruby, and I remember. I remember it all. What they did. We were clinging to our mother, my sister and I, when the humans killed her. They shot my father next. Then they chopped off their hands, their feet, their heads. Hmm. Something else to buy. 
There is a cluttered, musty store near my cage. They sell an ashtray there. It is made from the hand of a gorilla. Well, I'm gonna stop there, guys. Um, and then, well, that's not a very good place to leave off, but that's where I'm gonna stop today. I will continue reading um, next week. We're getting almost done. I would say probably about three more weeks. We can do about three more sections. So hopefully we can start finishing this up. Hopefully you're thinking about the book as we're reading it. And it seems like, you know, Ivan's kind of struggling to understand why um, humans had to hurt his family um, in such an awful way as well. So we will have our quiz on Friday. Bye guys.